She's still going up for the first time this evening. I've known of her work since I was training as an ontologist at Dana Farber in Boston. And I have to say, Dr. Raza was, has a little bit of a reputation as a maverick. Mm -hmm. And that's a, that could be a good thing or a bad thing. And in her case, it's a good thing because she was right. And she was right because she was studying a pre-leukemia disorder. And most people looked at it as it was a failure to produce enough blood cells. And what she showed is actually what was happening in the bone marrow was the cells were growing too quickly and then dying at a much faster rate. And that completely set the, the, the field on its head. And it helped us understand what's going on in this disorder. And so when people now look at it, they say, oh, that was so simple and obvious. Well, <laughs> it wasn't simple and obvious when she started out. Now in her book, The First Cell, she again is setting the cancer research field on its head by saying, we've got it wrong. We're spending too much time on advanced cancer. And at the Night Cancer Institute, we absolutely 100% agree with that. When we went out and raised a billion dollars, matched by Phil and Penny Knight, what we said is, why are we waiting until it's too late and then treating cancer? Why aren't we detecting it earlier? Why aren't we treating it earlier when cancer is more curable? So I'm absolutely delighted that now, in a poignant, personal book that talks about the first cell, Dr. Ezra Ross has actually come out and said, we have to do better in cancer. And so I'm delighted to have her here. So please give a warm welcome to Dr. Ezra Ross. Thank you, Brian. And I have known of you since you were a fellow also, one of the brightest, but also a very persistent young man who forced people to uh, his view, his point of thinking, which has completely shifted a paradigm in cancer, what uh, Dr. Brian Drucker did in case of uh, chronic myeloid leukemia treatment. Um, we have a family friend who once told my younger brother Abbas, he said, look, if the sun rises from the west suddenly, the whole world will stop dead in its track and stare at it. But then there are a few people who see the sun rise in the east every day and wonder why. And they are the only people who can change things. And the point of this is that we take too much for granted. Especially our health we take for granted. Until we end up in the emergency room suddenly and then you remember that the two words in the English language that make people the happiest are, it's benign. <laughs> we can't take our health for granted. Especially where cancer is concerned because it is a silent killer. There may be people in this room who have had cancer or who have cancer or who have lost a beloved one with cancer. And you know that for many, many people it's either discovered by serendipity or it is discovered when it has spread quite a bit. And that's the reason why we need to become more proactive about it. The problem that I see is that we are not even defining the problem. It was Einstein who said, if I am given an issue to resolve in one hour, I would spend 55 minutes describing the problem and 5 minutes about the solution. So it's very important to actually understand what we are facing and I feel like we have such blinders on our eyes that we don't even appreciate in its entirety the problem. And one issue was of course trying to define in very simple terms where cancer has come and I'll begin by giving just a few statistics to you. 
Today we can cure 68 percent of the cancers. The rest present with advanced disease and their outcome for the most part is the same that it was in 1930s. We are doing no better with advanced cancer. We have spent hundreds of billions of dollars in the last 40 years that I have been in this country and what really do we have to show for it? Basically one drug that Brian developed, one drug uh, that uh, not drug but vitamin A that has basically been curative for acute promyelocytic leukemia. These are the two curative things. In addition, immune therapies, antibodies, etc. have helped some rare types of cancers. But when we talk about the most common cancers, then the majority of patients really have not been helped by this research. Where are all the wonderful treatments for breast cancer, for example? So the point I'm making is 68% patients we are curing. Let's ask ourselves, what are we curing them with? The same chemotherapy, radiation therapy, surgery. So where is the advance? Slash, poison, burn. Yes, survival is better for those people, but only because we learn to use them better and we are diagnosing diseases early. That's it. And of course, the anti-smoking campaign. October 24th, Time magazine, Brian, I don't know if you saw this or not, Time magazine had a special issue on um, health. And the leader of NIH, Dr. Francis Collins, one of the most respected figures in the country who I really value and admire because he led the government's effort for sequencing of the human genome. I mean, one of the most solid scientists uh, and visionary leader. Um, in the, he wrote an essay in this Time magazine special supplement on health describing the vision for the future and what caught my eye in the first sentence, uh, first paragraph was the sentence which said, there has been a decrease in mortality from cardiovascular diseases by 70 percent and cancer is also coming down by 1 percent a year for the last 20 years, which means that it has decreased by 20 percent in the last 20 years. But to read it in such stark contrast, cardiovascular disease 70 percent decrease, cancer 1 percent. Why? Cardiologists got smarter than us. They don't let heart attacks happen. They fix the coronaries before. It's all about early detection and prevention. So why, aren't, is, why isn't cancer doing that? Second thing is this 1% decrease in mortality we are seeing every year again is not because of some wonderful new therapies we have discovered. It's all because of anti-smoking campaigns and the screening measures that have been put into place. And that basically tells me what screening measures do we use? Mammography where you squash a poor woman's breasts in such a painful, cruel um, manners. Number two, colonoscopy. How primitive can you get putting a tube in and looking to find cancer? I mean, in this day and age, PSA and pap smear, these are the four screening measures we use. These were done 60 years ago. Why have we not developed anything new? In this day and age of technology, why? Because everyone is too busy chasing after the last cancer cell trying to kill it. No one is thinking about, not no one, but very few are thinking about early detection. And the final reason for me to really focus and bring this to attention was that I wish to bring the patient back front and center into every discussion about cancer now. We have become so obsessed with curing a disease that we have forgotten about the illness. You see, disease is something that doctors diagnose and treat. Illness is what the patient suffers. We have become so obsessed with curing, we have forgotten about healing. So the book, in this book, what I decided to do 
is to look at every question in cancer through the prism of human anguish. And that is why looking in detail and with utmost granularity at the suffering and pain that people go through. Including pain that my husband went through. So tonight I thought that I will read a passage, if you don't mind, and then we can have a conversation uh, about one of my patients. So I, this patient that I took care of, who basically changed my life, uh, was when I was 32 years old at Roswell Park Cancer Institute, and she was uh, 34. So we were very close in age. JC went through painful phases of induct, so she had uh, a pre-leukemia and then developed acute leukemia. By the time I saw her, she had acute leukemia. JC went through the painful phases of induction and consolidation chemotherapies under my direct care. Once during a particularly savage cycle, I sat on the edge of her bed and in a feeble attempt to distract her, instead of telling her a joke, I recited a poem that I love. This condition of life is not for the whole year, only for the few months when it rains. The blazing fire of the dry wood will cook rice in no time. And everything will come back into view sharp and clear and when the rains depart we shall put out in the sun everything that is wet wood chips and all put out in the sun we shall even our hearts she burst out crying so did i it was unreal I was 32, starting my career. She was 34, dying. The leukemia relapsed a year and a half after her initial diagnosis. She wanted to be admitted for her terminal illness. As I rounded each morning, making believe with all sincerity that balancing her intake and output of fluids was the crucial order of the day, the inadequacy of my pathetic non-treatment plan slapped me in the face. JC was dejected, withdrawn. I longed for the days when she teased me with a wan smile would be all she could muster now. Gently, almost tenderly acknowledging my feeble attempts at light-heartedness. Successfully aborted before they began. She lost weight and hope, she stopped eating, forgot how to laugh, quit the morning and evening walks around the ward. She hardly left the room anymore. And then suddenly something snapped in her. An unexpected vehemence resurrected her withering skeletal frame, imbuing her with a newfound palpable energy. JC asked for pen and paper and started writing. Furiously, gone was the exhaustion and lassitude, gone the dozing stupor, the internal dismantling was abruptly suspended by the force of her intellectual zeal. She was a woman possessed. She filled legal-sized notepads, emptied pens, demanded more paper, extra ballpoints at odd hours of night and day. There were few tomorrows remaining and she was not wasting any of them. Her mind composed feverishly as the body decomposed. Over the course of a long career spent taking care of countless terminally ill patients, I have witnessed this sporadic burst of end-of-life force enough times to know it is real. Dishevelment of a body being gradually laid to waste, reassured sweetly through a cleansing terminal lucidity. How this happens, how she got enough strength in those emaciated carpels and metacarpals to balance pen on paper for hours on end, how she reassembled her dwindling psychic resources, 
how she filled page after page as her head pounded from profound hypoxia remains the human mystery. She did not volunteer information about what she was writing. I was too afraid to ask. Until one evening when we were alone, I did. Sit down, she said. For a while she remained silent, looking out the window. In that moment, as the fading sunlight cast oblique shadows on the pale walls of her hospital room in the newly renovated Carlton house, I became acutely aware of the glaring disparity. The fragile, crumbling state of a body, a sorry vessel to house so capacious a soul. She of the 2000 more insults camaraderie seemed ready to put the body away for good. It was humbling to imagine the gravity of her task that lay ahead. In telling me what she wrote, she was acknowledging the end. She turned her face and looked at me with a shadow of the old smile. Even the germs can't stand me anymore. I guess it's time to go. She swallowed hard and blurted out, I'm writing letters. I want my two and a half year old twin daughters to open on each of their birthdays. She hesitated, looked askance at me, almost bashful. Keep me alive until I reach the 21st. By the time JC died two days later, she had barely completed the letter for their 12th. I had my eureka moment as I signed her death certificate. JC died because her leukemia was too advanced by the time I saw her. It had taken her a year to cross over from pre-leukemia to leukemia. I should have treated her at the earliest pre-leukemic stage of the disease. Surely it would be easier to control my MDS, the pre-leukemia, rather than AML, the leukemia. From that day on, I announced to Harvey that evening, Harvey is my late husband, because of JC, I was going to concentrate on studying and treating MDS. Even at the ripe old age of 32, it was clear to me that the animal models were far too simplistic and artificial, utterly incapable of recapitulating a fraction of the complex disease I had seen evolve in JC's case. The only hope of dealing with so deadly a foe was to detect it at its earliest, earliest stage and apply the best available scientific technology to find ways to arrest it before all hell broke loose. If I studied both MDS and AML stages of the disease, I thought I could define the biologic milestones that mark how pre-leukemia cells cross over to the frankly leukemic stage. From that, a better understanding of the natural history of the malignant process would emerge, hopefully yielding novel potential therapeutic targets on the way. Harvey's response was, as your idea is spot on, but I can warn you right now, you will never get a grant funded. MDS is too rare a disease. No one can even pronounce it properly, let alone support your work. Of course, I did it anyway, so you know how much I listened to him. Had I gone to school in this country, my research would have involved attempts to reproduce the disease in mouse models or to create tissue culture cell lines from patients' malignant cells. Being an outsider, I had the audacity to follow instinct rather than custom. I could save every cell I was going to obtain from my future patients and study them thoroughly. It never occurred to me to do otherwise. And since 1984, I think there have been less than a handful of patients who have said no to me. And I have now more than 60,000 samples in this tissue repository of thousands of patients followed longitudinally as they progressed in their diseases from pre-leukemia to leukemia. And not one single cell has come from a second physician. To this day, I do five to 10 bone marrows in every clinic with my own hands. Actually, I use an electric drill now, yeah. <laughs> but I do all the marrows and it is such a deeply humbling experience to obtain those samples, which we are giving pain to patients for. 
these this tissue repository has so much information that can be gleaned from it now. We were waiting for a lot of technology to evolve which has now reached a godlike technologic advances of cutting and pasting DNA have evolved. We have the tissue, we have the technology, we need the public to wake up and support this work because the idea is to trace every patient back to their earliest pre-leukemic phase and then ask the question why did some healthy individual even get pre-leukemia? What was it that made them at high risk of getting MDS? Maybe there was some generic mutation like BRCA. Maybe there is some protein marker we'll be able to detect. And once we find that, then we can start monitoring healthy individuals who are at risk of getting pre-leukemia. So the whole idea, and I'll end now, is that what we need to do is stop looking at the human body once a year by these archaic techniques of mammography and colonoscopy and start treating the human body as if it is a machine and constantly monitor it for the appearance of the earliest perturbations caused by disease before the disease becomes even clinically apparent and then prevent its appearance. Thank you. Beautifully done and beautifully written. I just start with a question for you about uh, two questions. And first of all, what have you learned since on your now what, almost 30 year journey? Yeah. And I, I know you've been asked this question before, but if you had unlimited resources, how would you crack this problem? Because as you said, we have unbelievable technologies right now. And how would you, what would you do? Yes. Because you, you, I think you will get some grant funding now. <laughs> Well, the grant funding I need, let me say this, is I need a hundred million dollars. That kind of money grants don't give, so I'm hoping that the public will support me. Who should be most interested in finding the earliest foot, footsteps of cancer? Those individuals who are at high risk of getting cancer. Who are they? Well, some are, very few are genetically identifiable, like the BRCA gene or a very strong family history, but that's very rare. Most cancers appear out of nowhere. So the people who are at highest risk of getting cancer are those who have had one cancer already. One in five new cancers appear in a cancer survivor. So what I'm really um, pleading with the public is there are 20 million cancer survivors in the country. Even if 1 million individuals just give $10 a month for a year, that's it. The whole tissue repository can be studied. But where is the will? So when Brian asks me, you will get a grant, the grants they give are very small. Now, if uh, I lived in Portland, maybe I could raise a billion dollars. <laughs> but uh, um, New York, the competition is more for the paparazzi, not cancer so much. So um, I feel that the other question you asked me, what have I learnt and then what would I do? Well, the one thing I have learnt beyond a shadow of doubt is that the patient is the single most important thing that moves me, that inspires me, that gets me going, that provides the helium to keep my spirit up. Imagine on a daily basis, having the most profound conversations about life and death with individuals that you have been seeing for years on end. Slowly the curtains are parted and you are able to visualize grace in all its splendor when you see the suffering human being and trying to come to terms with mortality. I think the patients are the ones who provide me with the insight that my eyesight require to continue on a daily basis in a painful journey. So the thing I have learned above everything else is um, until we can provide a better life, it is our duty to make their deaths less painful and to be there every step of the way with them. I cannot emphasize 
um, how important it is. Do you know studies show that doctors interrupt their patients every 18 seconds. There are doctors called doorknob doctors, one hand is on the doorknob. How is somebody going to tell you life and death issues that are bothering them in the middle of the night, keeping them up, how scared they are when your one hand is on the doorknob. There's a beautiful Emily Dickinson thing which I'd like to read. I'm obsessed with Dickinson right now. I measure every grief I meet with analytic eyes. I wonder if it weighs like mine or has a different size. I wonder if they bore it long or did it just begin. I cannot find the date of mine, it's been so long a pain. I wonder if it hurts to live and if they have to try and whether could they choose between, they would not rather die. There is a corporeal language, the body language of patients to understand that we need to reach into our bookshelves of great masters and great classics to understand the essential mystery of humanity. And I think taking my cue from what is most important lesson for me in coming from the bedside is how to reduce the suffering of these individuals. And after 40 years and multiple cycles of great excitement caused first, let's say, in the 80s by oncogenes, in the 90s trying to choke off blood supply, then the human genome sequencing, and then now immune therapies, all these cycles that are met with crushing disappointments. I have really been more and more re um, affirming my original idea that the best way is to find it at the earliest possible and prevent it. So how would, what would I do if I had limitless fun? I am very aware that we have cancer patients now to deal with who have advanced disease. So we can't simply take all our resources and go in one direction. We must focus first and above everything else on the current patients and what can we do for them. The primary rule of cancer is first do no harm. We have to stop harming the patients. Every treatment that is brought out for advanced cancer I am talking about, the new therapies that are brought out, their failure rate is 95%. 5% that succeed should have failed because they are only prolonging survival by a few months. They are not curative, they are only palliative. So you are hurting 80 out of 100 people to benefit 20 for a few months and 42% of those people become financially completely ruined by two years. So what are we really doing to patients? Hurting them physically, hurting them financially, hurting them emotionally, psychologically in every way possible. Protecting ourselves, where does individual responsibility end and society's responsibility begin? These are the fundamental ethical questions that I have asked, but everything through patient suffering. What would I do? I would take care of the patients, stop hurting them, stop having these trials, these me too, thousands of trials looking at the same target because one drug got approved, so everyone wants to make their billion dollars. We have to, st where is the responsibility of our agencies who are allowing this to happen? Can you believe that I was treating acute myeloid leukemia in 1977 with two drugs called 7 and 3, 7 days of one, 3 days of another. 1977, today in 2019, 7 and 3, same treatment. How shameful is it that I have to have the exact same conversation, same side effects, same dreadful results day in and day out with patients. So how many more decades do I have to go on? This is, but 
we have patients to deal with. At least I can protect them from being put through financial ruin like this. And then second thing is of course for the future patients we have to go for early detection and here I would like to ask Brian the question and then I have a passage to read about uh, early detection. But you have been doing so much in this area and of course you are the one who also set the paradigm for treatment of early um, chronic myeloid leukemia. The same drug that cures chronic disease doesn't do so in advanced disease, the same disease. So. Well, thank you. And I, I've been saying, I've been giving talks about the development of this drug we developed. And the drug we developed was targeted at what drives the growth of a particular leukemia. And it used to be that people had, were told you have three to five years to live. And now people, I expect to live a normal lifespan. And it was absolutely remarkable. But when I talk about it, what I say is it took two things to make that happen. Number one, we had to match the right patient with the right drug. And number two, we had to treat early in the course of the disease. Yep. Nobody heard that second one. They said, oh, we'll treat advanced cancer with the right patient with the right drug and we see response that lasts for six months and everybody relapses. And I come back and said, but you forgot the second part. You have to treat early in the course of the disease. And much like Ezra, when I started out in my career, we had all these chemotherapy drugs for cancer. Now we've got all these targeted drugs and immune therapies for advanced cancer. For early detection, we have mammograms and PSA. <laughs> we've got to do better. Why don't we take the same understanding of what drives the growth of cancer and treat early as we possibly can? Now, my one question back to you, though, is the criticism we get is you look at mammograms and particularly PSAs, we overdiagnose. Yes. And we have too many men who get their prostates removed that don't need it. Yeah. So how do we balance? So how do we balance that? <laughs> You know, Brian, I come from a family of seven siblings. When we were growing up in Pakistan, there was a rule in my house that anyone over eight, the definition of a bum in my family was anyone over 18 not going to medical school. <laughs> so a lot of us went to med school. And my younger sister is the head of women's radiology at the Brigham. This question throws her into such tantrums when we say that, oh, mammography is uh, overdiagnosing. She has a fit because she says, yes, I would rather overdiagnose and put a needle into somebody's nodule in the breast and show that it's benign than be presented with stage 4 breast cancer. So, so what if we overdiagnose a few? But Brian is right about over-treatment. A lot of men underwent radical prostatectomies and surgeries when they didn't need it with very serious uh, consequences as a result of that debilitating um, surgery. The point is, why would treatment remain primitive? As we are developing new technologies, the same targeted therapies will work better. Maybe we won't even need to do radiation therapy and hurt people. Maybe we can just target with a laser. And this is a good time for me to just read one passage from here. Because Brian asked me if I had my the resources, what would I do? I would take 50% of it and spend it in doing serious trials because I still think we have a lot of good drugs but we are not matching the right patient to the right drug as Brian said. And our agencies who are charged with protecting patients are not doing their job because they don't demand sponsors who do trials must make an effort in every trial to identify individuals likely to respond to this agent by saving their samples, studying them properly. So when the next trial is done with the same agent, it enriches for the population of patients who are likely to respond. And that's how we will learn how to match. So half the money I would resources I would spend in the present cancer patient, making their life easier, better less painful and learn something from them because patients are so noble. This unanimously tell me, Dr. Raza, even if it doesn't help me, it will help someone else in the future. Take as much of my marrow as you want. 
people want to give me their bodies all the time. I'll die, you please take my body, do whatever, it will help someone else. This is what humans are. So I do think that we need to make a, there's no cutting corners with science by the way. We have to do rigorous scientific work. There is just no shortcut in this. And to do that, half the resources should go for the benefit of patients who have cancer now and the other half is this. Imagine a machine that automatically images your entire body while you are in your morning shower or bed sheets that scan you overnight or a smart bra that has 200 tiny biosensors built in to monitor micro alterations in temperature and texture worn for a, an hour a week. It generates sufficient data on an accompanying app to show distortions created by the presence of very few cancer cells or taking a pill whose contents are absorbed preferentially by cancer cells excreted in the urine and detected by a fit loo or receiving a cocktail of reporter genes whose protein products can be imaged with handheld devices like cell phones to pinpoint cancer cells anywhere in the body. How about yelling at a cancer using ultrasound? You hit a cancer with the ultrasound, you're yelling at it, it wiggles and it shakes off some of its proteins from the surface. Then you just do a blood test and you can pick up those proteins that it was not yielding before you yelled at it. So how about yelling at the tumor, uh, compelling it to reveal its presence and its lethal potential as the tumor is forced to shed markers into the blood when hit by waves at the right frequency or exhale deeply into a device that accurately recognizes the earliest footprints of cancer or simply prick your finger periodically to provide a drop of blood that identifies surrogate markers. And in fact, working with biomedical engineers at Columbia University, Sam Sia, who is the world's leading authority on microfluidics, is one of my great scientific partners. Sam got this M chip FDA approved now by the company Opco. This tiny little chip, men can use it at home, prick their finger, put one drop of blood in it and test their PSA at home with a tiny little device all, as often as you want. So once we identify a biomarker say for leukemia or pre-leukemia, all we have to do is load it on the M chip and the same drop of blood will test for PSA in one lane pre-leukemia in another, you can have a barcode of proteins for different cancers. Just have to do it. The above are not scenes from, a, from the fantastic voyage. These are real life technologies in various stages of development today, heralding the dawn of a new era in cancer research. Sam Gambier at the Canary Center at Stanford University is at the forefront of this revolution in early detection of cancer from blood, urine, stool, saliva, breath and tears using a host of generic sonic and imaging methods as is Bert Vogelstein at Johns Hopkins. The emergence of these groundbreaking technologies is a direct result of collaboration between experts coming from many disciplines, geneticists, biomedical engineers, radiologists, oncologists, molecular biologists, nanotechnologists, AI experts, computer scientists, bioinformatics wizards. Even in sports, teamwork and cooperation win the day. Why not in cancer? Here's a scenario from the future. Everyone from birth to death is regularly screened for the appearance of cancer cells in the body. Once detected, protein markers would be identified providing a zip code for the cancer cells. A tube of blood from the individual could be obtained, T cells would be isolated, activated, armed with the address for the cancer based upon the unique protein barcode and the RNA signature it expressed. These CAR T's can be injected back into the individual to seek out and kill every cell with that address. None of the toxic effects seen with the present CAR T therapies would be an issue because the tumor mass would be minuscule compared to what we are targeting now. No, rather every infant would be fitted with an implantable tiny device at birth that would constantly monitor for such a mishap. 
send signals in a timely manner so that confirmation, validation and treatment can swiftly follow. To detect the first cancer cell's footprints, a map of early biologic markers of cancers have to be developed and constructed. This is what most of our resources should be targeting. Thankfully, the race has begun. We will all benefit from cooperation at the deepest level. Heed the advice of an anonymous a sage who said, if you want to be incrementally better, be competitive. If you want to be exponentially better, be cooperative. Thank you. Before you open up the questions, can I get you just to say a little bit about your, your dear husband? And I know that, that your husband was a remarkable cancer researcher. And I know you write about him and the effect that he's had on your, your life, your career. Tell us a little bit about him and what he's meant to you. Uh, I was having dinner with Harvey's daughter, Vanessa, who's here in the room. And uh, uh, I was telling her that when I started writing this book, it was because my daughter, uh, Shahrz our daughter, Harvey's and mine, Shahrzad, uh, two years ago, at 22, her best friend got diagnosed with a horrible brain tumor. And he died at 23. And when he first underwent, uh, he felt some weakness in his arm, was rushed to the emergency room, he was quadriplegic within hours and when the neurosurgeons opened him up, they couldn't remove the tumour. So from point zero, it was obvious to every oncologist that this poor boy's chance of survival is 0, 0.00 beyond a few months because he has one of the most vicious tumours known to man. Do you know what this boy said when he opened his eyes from the anaesthesia, Brian? He simply turned to his mother, Elena, who's one of my dear friends, and said, Mom, don't worry, just call Azra. She's on the cutting edge, she will find a cure for me. And I felt so ashamed, I don't know how I look at myself in the mirror that this boy, how we let him down? And I ask the question, how many Andrews will it take for us to be shaken out of our complacency? So I started writing about the patients and I was telling Vanessa earlier that when I had written about the patients, I realized that it would be very dishonest of me and insincere if I then didn't write my own story. It is very hard. It's been 18 years since my husband died. He was a very well-known, well-acknowledged, famous leukemia expert, my mentor. Some of the best earlier work in acute leukemia is all done by Harvey and his colleagues. He had started a whole intergroup which was nationally very active. And in a cruel twist of irony, he gets the very disease he has dedicated his life to cure since he was 15 and underwent the most painful five years almost, which then I had to force myself to write about it because I felt it is not fair that I'm writing other people's personal stories in such detail and somehow it's felt like I'm protecting myself. So now Brian Harvey's story is running like a red line throughout the book. And only one episode I would like to tell you and then we can stop. Uh, after he died three weeks later, my daughter who was eight years old at the time got a very bad flu. She was very sick, her asthma got aggravated and it took like five, six days for her to start feeling better. And one morning I was sitting in the living room working and suddenly this child comes out screaming and crying inconsolably. Finally when she calmed down, I was convinced she has had a relapse and is feeling much worse. Finally when she calmed down, she said, no mommy, actually I feel completely fine today. But now I know how terrible it feels to be sick and how good it feels to get better. And my dad never got better. Thank you. Um, at this 
would you like to, at this point, we'd like to open this up to questions, um, but I just want to let everybody know what a remarkable person we have here tonight. Visionary, uh, somebody you would want as your doctor, somebody who understands what it is to take care of patients, but also to be a scientist and try to do better, and somebody who believes that by cooperation, collaboration, we can beat this disease, but we need to do something differently. So this is a remarkable, remarkable person, remarkable physician, remarkable scientist who's told some incredible stories tonight. So thank you, thank Reza, you, for Frank. being here. Thank and, thank you. You. And, and we would love to take some questions. Ozone therapy. Uh, Ozone therapy. You answer this one. Huh? Um, I, I must confess I don't know a lot about it, um, but I'm always willing to learn something that I don't know. I've been using it for 20 years to serve people with cancer. It works 100% of the time, unless a person first gets to me too late. Yeah, they, like, when the cancer needs a certain point, there's no return. Other than that, it's 100% worth the time. All types of cancers. You need to figure out how to get that mainstream. They won't pay. I was on national TV on a talk show telling people about this case, but they never aired that episode. Thank you. Well, yes, sir. So, during the towards the end of uh, the Obama administration, Vice President Biden was sort of leading this initiative that was sort of the war on cancer work. Moonshot the moonshot cancer. And in his telling, and I'm sort of paraphrasing, it was, we have the solutions. It's just that people are not talking to each other. It's very siloed. And that, the, the, so the, the, the thing to do was to find a way to, you know, create this cross-sectional and cross-pollination and get people to work together. But we have the answers, and we can do that. So I'm interested in hearing from both of you, because you are you know, practitioners, and your care for what you do is so palpable, both of you. So is that, is that the state of affairs, or is, does that completely miss the point? Uh, as in, an, are we barking up the wrong tree? Or are there, do we understand the biology, right? Uh, you know, the pathways well enough. Um, is, you know, and I'm curious to hear about that as well. Um, and lastly, um, you know, there are certain, um, there are certain, Vinay Prasad at OHSU <laughs> talks a great deal about, you know, how our funding is so misdirected and, you know, the pharmaceutical industries and how they make money and all the rest of it, and, and that's sort of the big problem. So where would you, so if you have to pick, where is the highest leverage not to turn, that we are not turning? Yes. Or one, two, or three? Number one, we are not doing enough for early detection. It's the only way because end-stage cancer is too rapidly mutating, changing, evolving, metamorphosizing, so we can't handle it. And all our efforts right now seem to be directed at chasing after that last cancer cell, which keeps changing. So, in a way, what you said is correct, that many effective treatments are already there, but they're being used at the wrong time. And to develop more effective treatments and more effective ways of diagnosing cancer earlier and earlier, we need the cooperation across disciplines. The consilience of experts has to be there. There's no question about that. I do think that my one very urgent criticism is why are we patting ourselves on the back with curing children with chemo, radiation, transplant, horrible immune cellular therapies? Why are we giving ourselves gold medals over it? It is so horrifying a treatment. It's like taking a bat, hitting a dog with the baseball bat to get rid of its fleas. That's how bad this treatment is. We need to get away from it. 
I get really allergic when people start telling me, oh, we are, we are curing so many cancers right now. Curing how? The same thing I was using 50 years ago. So where has all the money gone? So why is that not so obvious to, to as you, 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 the way you say it, it seems to be, should be so obvious. Why is it not that obvious? The same reason, why isn't it obvious that no one can sit and catalog night sweats and joint pains in a mouse? Why are we studying mice as surrogates for humans? and developing cancer treatments. Why isn't it obvious? Because a whole industry start arising around these things and before you know it, the picture has reached such grotesque, uh, absurd levels of uh, fantasy basically that you forget where you started. Don't you agree, Brian? I, I agree that it is obvious. The problem is, is that when I started out my career, I was actually Dana-Farber in Boston, and I said, well, I think we can attack cancer by targeting specifically. And I was told, there's the door. And when it became obvious through the drug I developed that it, it could happen, everybody jumped on and said, oh, of course. You made it look easy. If we had something in this early detection space, a proof of concept, that first blood test, that first urine test, everybody would jump on it. And so you've got to pave the, the road. And once you pave the road, everybody travels it. But right now, because everybody's traveled these roads of advanced cancer, and they say, oh, we're making some inroads, that's where everybody goes. And you know, it's kind of like a bunch of lemmings in science. You see, okay, that's working, let's go that way. And then there's a few of us mavericks that are saying, you got it all wrong. We got to go over here if you're going to make a big impact. We've got to show the way forward. Yeah. And once that happens, we will break this wide open and everybody's going to follow. The way I also want to reinforce what Brian is saying by telling you that at the moment the strategy for treating cancer we keep hacking at the leaves forgetting about the root we need to go for the root and Thomas Kuhn in his famous book uh, structure of scientific revolution shows beyond a shadow of doubt that the only way to convert and shift paradigms is to show a better way because no one is going to give up what they're doing willingly you have to show a better way so as long as you set a new goal, like Brian said, and financially incentivize it, that's it. All these people who are now investing in an enterprise that has a 95% failure rate <laughs> will rush to start investing in early detection. And I'm very hopeful. In fact, this is not a doom and gloom book. I'm waiting for Brian's wife to read it and give him the <laughs> cliff notes over it. <laughs> I asked my last chief of uh, oncology, so what book did you read recently because I am a reader and he goes, Azra, the only books I read now are the ones that my wife throws at me. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm actually going to have everybody at the Night Cancer Institute read this because this is what we're living and breathing. And we've set up an institute where we believe in teamwork, project-based science, getting to the part of the problem and focus on early detection and bringing together scientists, biologists, Perfect. nanotechnologists, engineers, computationalists to work as a team. Perfect. And we built the building around those concepts. Yes. And that's what we're trying to accomplish here. And that's what, for those of you that participated in the Night Challenge in 2013 to 2015, that's what we set out to do. And that's what our project is. Congratulations. It is an amazing feat that you have already accomplished with CML. But I think what you are heading for is even going to be bigger than CML. I predict it right here, guys. <laughs> Remember me. I am the one who predict, uh, predicted that Brian is going to do even bigger and better things for humanity. Although he has totally shifted one entire paradigm in cancer. And that you can say only, I don't know, except a handful of people like yourself. Thank you. Of course. I think we'll have time for two more questions. Yes.
Well, in view of what you are saying, you're talking about the results, basically, once you find the disease. But it really goes back to the doctor that has his hand <laughs> on the door. <laughs> and that's where it begins, because we don't identify anything any longer. I mean, we look at a patient and we have probably seven minutes at the most, and in the meantime, you're just filling up, you know, code numbers. So you miss everybody. You really do. By the time that they go to see the doctor, it's, it's, it's too late. Yes. I couldn't so agree change, more with you. How, yes. How do we change the system? Then? I think bringing things like artificial intelligence to do all the scut work for us will free the humans to have more okay. human interaction. Oh. So I do think that we that kind of separation is being realized and being promoted. Mm -hmm. And believe me, somebody who's an old timer like me, an old hag, this is what I constantly go on at my fellows and residents and people I mentor about, that there is no uh, substitute for actually spending time with the patient and listening to them. But the other component of that is that we have to make these early detection tests simple. Yeah. Colonoscopy is not going to be the answer. Mm -hmm. It has to be a blood test, a urine test, something that people can do easily, quickly, and if the results are positive, then you have that followed up. If they're negative, you go on about your, your way. Or it has to be something that you do in the home. So simplicity is key to make this work. Yeah, on that point, Brian, I mean, the question I have, and since you are showing uh, you know, a great deal of concern about the patient's welfare, I think it's great. And I'm also really excited about this era of early detection. But what about the imperfect tests, the false positives, and the anxiety that some normal individuals are going to feel if they get a test result back that suggests they have a cancer somewhere? Mm -hmm. I have a good answer for you because I'm asked this question 100% of the time. Well, the answer is that we, the best way to take away the anxiety is to have a solution that if we find something, you won't be beaten with a baseball bat. We actually have something that will work very quickly, very effectively and remove the earliest footprint. Then there won't be the kind. Right now, the anxiety is, oh my God, I have cancer, I'm dead. But this will become like you have fl the flu. So uh, look for the future. We are not saying that if uh, something here in my head of pancreas is detected overnight by this sheets I slept in, the next morning I should have open abdominal surgery and a Whipple's procedure. Of course not. What happens is you follow that through uh, the bed sheets. Can you please move a little this way? You follow that with the bed sheets, monitor it for a few weeks. If you see the lesion growing, changing, advancing, then you do 20 other tests supplementally before you do anything. And then what you can do is uh, target the thing with a laser beam instead of giving radiation. So what Brian and I are both, I think, agreeing on is that early detection will bring its own set of easier treatments that will take away a lot of this anticipatory anxiety. It is a legitimate one, but only a theoretical one right you now. You can find the source of it. But yeah. I, I did see, I did see a, a little hint of skepticism. So let me re try to reframe that. If I had a test that said, we think you have an infection, would that worry you? No, because the source there, you know, it's a systemic treatment. But for a cancer, if you want to target it with radiation or something else, you do want to know where it is, right? Is it, are these, this uh, you know, mutated DNA you're picking up in a, in a blood test, is it coming from, what tissues is it coming from? Well, Grail just announced yeah. that they not only have the, the cell-free DNA they can pick up, they can identify the organ it's coming from. Yeah. So with time, these will become better and be we are not saying we are there. We are saying at least it has to be investigated. Yeah, that, that, test, that so, test is coming out. Coming very out, soon. yes. And the data I've seen on it looks pretty spectacular. Yes. No, yeah, it's, it's, happy that's, to. That's, that's <laughs> they're, they're, it's again, very exciting. The science fiction that Ezra's talking about is happening right, right now. Yes. And there are tests being available from Bert Vogelstein at Johns Hopkins. Cancer Seek. Cancer Seek from Grail. 
These tests are M chip. Working. Don't forget yeah. our M chip, yes, please. The M chip. <laughs> I'm okay. working on implantable uh, chips that can be put under the skin now and these with hydrogels. At least the cancer seek in the Grail test may have 99.5% specificity. That would mean one out of 200 false positives. So that's a pretty remarkable. You know, we'll have to see whether that pans out. But that future is now. And that, that's why I will leave you with that ray of hope. <laughs> no, I always have the last word. Yes, she, of course you do. <laughs> My wife does as well. Thank okay. you. Okay. <laughs> Women have that habit. <laughs> Uh, let's end on a happier note because I love poetry. So why don't we end with a little uh, poem from Alfred Lord Tennyson? Oh, I think I know which one. Which one? <laughs> a cry and a child. No, but that's a beautiful one too. But this is a forward-looking one. The lights begin to twinkle on the rocks. The long day wanes, the slow moon rises, the deep moans round with many voices. Come, my friends, it's not too late to seek a newer world, for my purpose still holds, to sail beyond all the stars in the western sky until I die. It may be we shall touch the happy isles. It may be we shall see the great Achilles whom we knew. And though much is taken, much abides. And though we are not now that force which in olden days moved heaven and earth, that which we are, we are. One equal temper of heroic hearts made weak by time and fate, but strong in will to strike, to strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield. Thank you. Thank you.